Welcome to NYU's Casa Italiana Zerilli Marimò. I am Eugenio Rifini, a faculty member in the Department of Italian Studies here at NYU, and I'm absolutely delighted to be introducing tonight's event. Um, we are up for a very special treat, uh, but first of all, let me thank both Casa Italiana and my department for their continuous and generous support. Um, this event is part of a broader series of events which I'm curating entitled Viva Voce, devoted to the intersections of voice, performance, and uh, reception. So tonight, we are celebrating um, a very important publication, the first and possibly the ultimate uh, critical edition of the opera L'Empio Punito by Italian composer Alessandro Melani, an opera which was first given in Rome in 1669, uh, and which, as the title of our event uh, suggests somewhat playfully, brings on stage the story of Don Giovanni, even if the name of the protagonist um, is a different one. Uh, and we are here more than one century earlier um, than, of course, the most famous version of the story, which is that of Mozart's Don Giovanni. If you are intrigued by all this, hold on for just a little while, um, for your curiosity will be satisfied shortly. Uh, let me just show you the book which we are presenting tonight is this voluminous uh, book publication. Um, and uh, let me get started with introducing our guests. We are lucky enough tonight to have with us the editor of L'Empio Punito, Dr. Luca della Libera, who will introduce um, us to Melani's opera, followed by two responses from fellow scholars Elizabeth Weinfield and Giuseppe Gerbino, before we make room for a selection of arias from the opera to be performed by the early music ensemble Sonnambula. So we will have a musical component tonight as well. And this is the first time that this music is heard this side of the pond. I mean, I think apart from last night and, you know, during the rehearsals. Um, but that was a private thing. So um, this is the first public performance of arias from Limpio Punito um, in the US. So we are indeed making a little history tonight. Um, let me introduce briefly our guests. Um, Luca della Libera graduated in flute at the Conservatory of Santa Cecilia in Rome and in history of music from the University La Sapienza. He obtained his PhD from the University of Rome, Tor Vergata, and the University of Mainz in Germany with a dissertation on Alessandro Scarlatti's Sacred Music, which became a book which is now available in English as well. It's been translated recently, titled The Roman Sacred Music of Alessandro Scarlatti. He is a tenured professor of history of music at the Conservatory of Frosinone and music critic for the newspaper Il Messaggero. His main field of research is the music of Baroque Rome, on which he has published extensively. The edition of L'Empio Punito by Alessandro Melani, which came out with A&R editions earlier this year, is only the latest among his many achievements. So we're really happy to have him with us tonight. Um, our respondents are Elizabeth Weinfeld and Giuseppe Gerbino. Elizabeth Weinfeld is a music historian, faculty member at Juilliard, whose research explores the relationships among gender, performance, and race in the early modern period. She holds a PhD in historical musicology from the Graduate Center at CUNY, an MST in music from Oxford, and a BA in art history from Rutgers. Elizabeth is the founder and artistic director of the ensemble Sonnambula, which we will hear tonight, um, which, um, with which she has designed a series of specific, um, site-specific concerts for the Met Museum and the Cloisters, the Hispanic Society, the Freak Collection, and they also have recently published the first complete recording of the music of the 17th century composer uh, Leonora Duarte, um, on whom she's also completing a monograph. Giuseppe Gerbino is a long-standing um, friend of Casa Italiana, professor of music and history uh, and historical musicology at Columbia University. His interests include the Italian madrigal, the relationship between music and language in the early modern period, early opera, and Renaissance theories of cognition and sense perception. He is the author of numerous publications, including the monograph Music and the Myth of Arcadia in Renaissance Italy, um, he has received many grants and fellowships, too many uh, for me to list 
them here. Um, and among his many hats, he's also the co-editor of the online digital edition of the works of Luca Marenzio. So we will have an introductory lecture by Professor uh, Della Libera, our two responses, a brief conversation um, uh, among our guests. And finally, we will have um, uh, the musical performance uh, from the ensemble Sonnambula. So Sonnambula is a historically informed ensemble that brings to light unknown music for various combinations of early instruments. Um, under the direction of Dr. Weinfeld, Sonnambula has performed for uh, the early music program at Ann Arbor, uh, Houston Early Music, Duke University, Troy Friends of Chamber Music, and the Indianapolis Early Music Festival. Sonnambula has been the ensemble in residence at the Metropolitan Museum, uh, where they designed site-specific series for the Cloisters Museum. As I recalled earlier, they recently released a recording of uh, the music of Leonora Duarte with Center Records. Um, so I'm really excited uh, about this program. And uh, um, just a couple of practical things. Um, this is the order of things, so the lecture of responses and then the concert. Um, we also have here um, a Wi-Fi which you can access and where you guessed, um, you know, we have the details for user and passwords, feel free to join um, the web and you know, let people know that you are here with us. We also have people attending remotely, so um, hello to our guests um, from afar. Um, and let's get started with um, Dr. De La Libera's lecture. So you know, join me in introducing and uh, welcoming Dr. Luca De La Libera. Thank you, Eugenio, uh, for this invitation. I'm very, very happy and honored to be here in this s such incredible city and university. So thank you very much. And thank you to all the musicians for have to have accepted this, this project and so to have musicology and music performance together. <clears throat> Alessandro Melani's Lempio Punito was performed on 17 February 1669 at the Teatro Colonna in Rome during the pontificate of Pope Clement IX, Giulio Rospigliosi. Lorenzo Onofrio Colonna was a member of one of the Rome's most eminent noble families and an essential patron for opera between Venice and Rome. The relationship between Alessandro Melani's brother, Atto Melani, and Lorenzo's wife, Maria Mancini, probably played an essential part in strengthening the Melani brothers' position in the first Roman opera seasons at the Teatro Colonna. Salvatore Rosa, a painter and, and a poet who worked for Colonna, had a close relationship with the theater and Commedia dell'arte, and he was present at the first performance of Lempio Punito. His letter to the Bolognese poet Giovanni Battista Ricciardi is crucial since it is the only source to name Giovanni Filippo Apolloni as responsible for the versification of the text, along with Acciaiuoli, who was named as the librettist. This is the, the manuscript in the Vatican Library. Um, we have uh, here the libretto, the printed the libretto, uh, Lempio Punito, Dramma Musicale del Signor NN, Nation Omen, and then here the characters, uh, the long list of characters, and I will talk later about the, the, na the strange, very strange names of these characters, and the mutazioni di scene, change settings, and also these are very important and very complicated. Uh, the, the opera was named as Opera Regia to explain the, the complexity of the, the staging. The music sources. We have the, the source in Biblioteca Vaticana in the Chigi collection, mostly copied by Giovanni Antelli, a very famous Italian copist. He copied in the same collection the Giasone and Serse and by Cavalli and Ercole in Tebe by Jacopo Melani and other uh, composers. And then we have a score that I, I found here in the States, in the Library of Congress, uh, also uh, from, um, uh, from an, uh, Antelli, the same copist. It's very interesting and it's very rare that we have 
choose cores of the same copies. Both scores present measures crossed out and alternative notes in a few corresponding passages. For this reason, we can assume that they were used for specific performance. At the same time, given their elegant presentation, they must ha also have been in intended for collection. Then we have a score in Naples, Biblioteca del Conservatorio, San Pietro Maiella. And we have the, 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 a copy of the duet, Se d'amor la cruda sfinge, that we will listen later. Uh, this manuscript is preserved in anthology of cantatas. This, um, this source contains uh, the continuo and, and the voice staves only, I will show you later. And then we have a, a source in Belgium, in Conservatoire Royal de Liège, also uh, just of a single aria, Gradite Catene Legami Amorosi, sung by Cloridoro. Um, this is the, the beginning of the famous duet, Se d'amor la cruda sfinge, uh, in, in the Vatican uh, manuscript. Uh, and this is the same page in the Library of Congress. They are both copied by the same uh, copist, uh, Giovanni Antelli. He was very famous. Um, and here we have the, the same music in the Naples Conservatory source, and it's interesting that the music starts, begins with the voice, so there are no violins. And uh, this, show, this shows that the purpose of this realization was to enjoy the beauty of this moment of the opera without any preoccupation to recreate in, in, in its entirety. The last music source is in Liège, the aria Gradite Catene Legami Amorosi. Like the Neapolitan source, this one contains the vocal and continuous staves only, with no violins sharing the same purpose. A collection of drawings of the French painter Pierre-Paul Sevin, active in Rome between 1666 and 1671, are related to the production of Lempio Punito. Here we, we see the, the first scene of the opera with the horses. Uh, and then we have um, <coughs> Proserpina's palace and Acrimante, the, the main character, Don Giovanni, sleeping, and Proserpina with the devils. And then we have we have other, uh, the, the one of the, the final scenes of the opera with uh, the main character and uh, Charon with the boat. We have a lot of libretti, uh, in, mostly in Italian libraries, but also in London, in Paris, and here in the States. Um, The first uh, performance at the Teatro Colonna was sponsored by Cardinal Flavio Chigi, Prince Agostino Chigi, Lorenzo Onofrio Colonna, and Cardinal Giacomo Rospigliosi, a collective patronage following the successful production of Il Girello uh, the year before. So it's important, that it's not just a, one single family, but many families together to, for the, the production of the opera. Contemporary accounts describe Lempio Punito as a novelty and praise its production, especially the visual aspects. And here there is a, a diario or a viso of the time. So, uh, un sontuoso apparato, ricchissimi abiti, vaghe, bellissime mutazioni, sinfonie e balli superbi, alla presenza di, della maestà della regina di Svezia, the Queen Christian of Sweden. The only archival source regarding payments refers to Acciaioli, who was paid 200 gold scudi per il regalo delle spese nella commedia in musica durante questo carnevale in Borgo. So this is the only archival source about payments to musicians, and this is very, it's a pity because they are very important for, you know, for, for, for the history of, of 
the performance and many other things. Very probably, Acciaiuoli realized and directed the opera's complex stage setting, given his experience in this field. However, uh, certainly, Giuseppe Fede, soprano castrato, and Francesco Verdoni, bass, took the roles of Acrimante, Don Giovanni, and Atrace, respectively. In January 1669, they were given leave from the Cappella Pontificia choir to participate in the opera. This is a document, the uh, Diario Sistino that I found in the Vatican Library, and it's clear that this document refers to Lempio Punito. In Italy, many comi comici dell'arte spread the subject of Don Giovanni throughout the 17th century, probably having manuscript scenarios at their disposal. There is evidence that Commedia dell'arte versions were played in Naples between 1621 and 1625 at the Teatro San Bartolomeo. During this early period, an essential Spanish source was the slightly later El Burlador de Sevilla, I Convidado de Piedra, published in 1630 in Barcelona but, and attributed to the Spanish friar Gabriel Telles, known as Tirso de Molina. At the same time, in Italy, the subject's written circulation is evident from anonymous manuscript scenarios La Teista Fulminato and Il Convitato di Pietra, preserved in the Biblioteca Casanatense in Rome. The comedy Il Convitato di Pietra was published in many Italian cities and attributed to the Florentine Giacomo Andrea Cicognini. He was one of the most famous Italian poets who authored the libretto of Francesco Cavalli's Giasone and Antonio Cesti's Orontea, among others. Performance of Il Convitato di Pietra occurred in Florence and in, in other cities, and Florence also hosted performance of L'Ateista Fulminato, Il Nuovo Risarcito Convitato di Pietra, by Giovanni Battista Andreini, a festa teatrale with music, many scene changes, and complex machinery. Italian actors of Commedia dell'arte played an a crucial role in the circulation of Don Giovanni's story between Italy and France. One of the most famous was Tiberio Fiorilli, who created the character of Scaramuccia, Scaramouche in France. He spent many years in Paris with his company, where he met Molière and his troupe in 1658. The Italian and the French troupe played in the same theater. Fiorilli and his company represent the most probable source of inspiration for Molière's Don Juan. Fiorilli had also had a close relationship with the Colonna family in Rome. He was in the Eternal City during the Carnival of 1669, Lempio Punito, so we cannot exclude his role in choosing the subject for the opera. It is not easy to establish what determined the choice of this subject for the 6069 opera season in Rome. The Colonna family's cultural endeavors would have been influenced by their close connection with Spain. Lorenzo Onofrio was appointed contestabile of the Kingdom of Naples in 1659 and viceroy of Aragona in 1677 and his library contained many volumes of Spanish plays, as well as volumes by members of the Venetian Accademia degli Incogniti. By borrowing many elements from classical literature, Acciaioli and Apolloni distanced their story from topoi of the original myth, thereby creating space to parody some of its previous models. The story of Lempio Punito take place, takes place not in the typical environs of the Spanish-Italian tradition, but rather in the pseudo-classical pseudo city of Pella, the birthplace of Alexander the Great in Macedonia's ancient kingdom. <clears throat> Thank you.
more evidence of the classical influence of in late 17th century Roman opera in general, and Lempio Punito in particular, is the choice of character names. Acrimante, Don Giovanni, may have been inspired by Agramante, the king of the Moors in two Italian poems, Orlando Innamorato by Matteo Boiardo and Orlando Furioso by Ludovico Ariosto. In the latter poem, Agramante is the most potent enemy of Orlando, one of the paladins of the Christian army. Similarly, in Lempio Punito, Acrimante is a staunch enemy of religion, which may have prompted Apollonius' choice of name. In Apolloni libretto for the 6055 opera Lergia, one of the main characters is Atamante, the king of Cyprus, a Greek mythological hero mentioned in Ovid's Metamorphosis. The name is similar to Lempio Punito Atamira, princess of Corinth and betrayed wife of Acrimante, Don Giovanni. In Cicognini's comedy La Damira, ovvero la statua dell'onore, published, published in several Italian cities, the eponymous main character's name resembles that of Apollonius' heroine. The second couple in Lempio Punito consists of Cloridoro and Ipomene. The name Cloridoro seems to be based on the union of the names Cloridano and Medoro, also from Orlando Furioso. Like Cloridano, Cloridoro is a hunter, and Ippomene takes her name from Ippomene, a mythical hero from Book 10 of Ovid's Metamorphosis. He won Atalanta's hand in marriage in a race against her other suitors. The third couple in Lempio Punito are the comic characters, Delpha and Bibi. Delpha, Ipomene's nurse, also appears as a character in Giasone, thought with a different vocal range. It's difficult to say where the name Bibi <laughs> could originate. However, the repetitive syllables could be a comic reference to characters like Demo and Tartaglia, the stuttering servants in Giasone and Il Girello. The dramaturgical structure and conventions of the libretto Lempio Punito are extraneous to the subject of Don Giovanni, suggesting a diversity of sources rather than a direct filiation of single source from a single source. The three primary couples in Lempio Punito uh, ar uh, revolve around the hinge character of Acrimante. Cloridoro Ipomene, Atrace Atamira, and Bibi Delfa. However, the pattern is complicated by Acrimante. Standing outside the natural order, he disrupts the usual love patterns. Atamira, repeatedly rejected and insulted, loves Acrimante to such an extent that she devises a plan to save his life by giving him a sleeping potion rather than the poison she promised Atrace she would uh, administer. Acrimante, on the other hand, is obsessed by, with Ipomene and it is her attempted rape that brings about the climax of the, of the story. The number of couples and their related intrigues is therefore expanded to five. Acrimante's all, uh, only trickery appears in a part of the backstory. He deceived Atamira in a false marriage. He flirts with Ipomene, but he does not know that she is the lover of his friend Cloridoro. He never changed identity, 
if you uh, remember the, the Mozart, Don Giovanni, you know, the change of identities is essential in, in Don Giovanni's story. Similarly, with Faust, he offers twice his soul. He asks Pluto for a lavish feast to share with the Tidemos, Tidemos statue and to Charon in exchange for his return to the land of the living. Another difference uh, from the, the, the topos or the, 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 the typical uh, schema of Don Giovanni, the opera does not begin with the erotic exploits of the protagonist, but with the lovers, Cloridano and Ipomene. Then, Acrimante never wears others' clothes. The deception via in, in person, impersonation is entrusted not to Acrimante, but to his servant Bibi, who also leads the seduction of other characters. The only deception is led by Delpha, who, to frighten her beloved Bibi, pretend to be the spirit of Acrimante. And Bibi never moralizes his master, and there is no request for repentance by the statue to the protagonist. So, you see, all these uh, kind of topo, topoi do not belong to the Don Giovanni tradition. And themes of honor and blood tie, crucial in Tirso de Molina, are almost absent, with the only ex exception of the final marriage between Atrace and Atamira. Also, other topoi do, do not belong to the Don Giovanni tradition. The prison scene, you know, if you... If you Think to the opera of the 18th century, Fidelio and other opera, but not, not in Don Giovanni. The false poison, sleep and dreams as a refuge or escape from reality, and the presence of statues. So all these, uh, th the long list of <laughs> these uh, issues are uh, very interesting be because they, they don't belong to this the, the past versions of the, of the story. Then, the libretto of Lempio Punito also utilizes some borrowings and self-borrowings from other operas, poems and theater, theater texts. Of course, I, I, I can't uh, show you all, all the, the particular, but just to, to, to see the, 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 the most important they are very, very clearly uh, borrowing, borrowings or self-borrowings by Apolloni himself. We find um, words and, and lines also from these, these poems. <coughs> Lempio Punito also has many connections with Il Giasone by Cavalli, not only in the libretto, as we can si hier, se dardo pungente d'un guardo lucente il sem mi ferì, fu troppo acuto dardo al folgorar d'un guardo, resto fero, ferito il seno. Of course, uh, it's not exactly the same, but it's, yeah, for my opinion it's clear that, that there is a, a very close connection. But also I found a, a, con a musical connection between il Giasone and l'Empio Punito. This is uh, the famous aria, very famous aria uh, in Il Giasone by Cavalli. Of course, there is not um, the same music, but I think that it's very, very similar. We can hear, listen just a few moments. <laughs> Sorry, but just to, to, 
to, to, to listen the People uh, were obsessed with Giazzone. Giazzone was the most f famous and, and known opera in the 17th century. So I think that there is, th this connection is very clear. And then there is also an, another connection between... Sorry, <laughs> it's like Schoenberg. <laughs> and this is very interesting because uh, there is a, a, a multiple connection, uh, Tirso de Molina, Melani and Cavalli, because uh, I found in the, these lines in Burlador de Sevilla, I'm sorry for my Spanish, el que en bien gozar espera cuanto espera desespera, it's clear that uh, the, the, the libretto è solo a chi spera chi mera il gioir, dispeme fallace seguace il martir. So there is also a connection with Tirso de Molina in this, in this point of the opera. Then, we don't know, of course, this is another very interesting story about the connection between uh, Mozart and Da Ponte. And we don't know if Da Ponte knew the libretto, but take a look of, of, on this. Gran tormento che mi par lavorar la notte lì, Melani. Notte giorno faticar per chi nulla sa gradir. It seems more than a coincidence to me. I don't know, but of course it's just a, a suggestion. And also the famous uh, um, point of the, of the opera in the... In, in, in the garden with the statue of the Commendatore, non si pace di cibo mortale, chi si pace di cibo celeste, and the statue in Melani, chi ha vivande celesti un disavvezza, ogni cibo terreno odia e disprezza. So, this is also very interesting. Now some observation about the music, and that we will listen later. <clears throat> there are striking music differences between Atamira's and Acrimante's opening arias. Melani provides Atamira which, with much more musical time to depict her character. In Acrimante's Io, Io va mai e vadorai, the first aria, the most, mostly scholar and syllabically set opening verses are punctuated by imitation in the instruments. Uh, Atamira, uh, you, you see, uh, the, you can see the, the, the difference between the, the, the first aria of the main characters. However, as the opera pro progresses, Acrimante's musical writing evolves and Melani expands Acrimante's musical vocabulary to express a personality with passions that complicate the stereotypical character of the libertine. The composer freely adopts the musical style in textual passages with a regular metric structure. For example, uh, in the longest aria of the opera that we will listen later, Piangete occhi piangete, Atamira expresses all her sadness after having met Acrimante, hoping to find peace and sleep. Uh, piangete occhi piangete begins with a lament underlined, underlined by the setting of the textual refrain, piangete occhi piangete, to a fourth descending by step at the end of the second strophe. 
And this is very interesting because uh, the same structure uh, of the, the, the text uh, is set to music in recitative, recitative style, and w we will listen later. The climax of the score is the duet Se d'amor la cruda sfinge, <clears throat> at the midpoint of the opera, and also we will listen uh, later. The duet is strophic, but each strophe is sung by a different character, uh, Acrimante and Atamira, a sort of aria for two parts with two very different texts. Acrimante, about to be escorted to prison, declares himself a prisoner of his love for Ipomene, while Atamira wishes for his freedom. At Acrimante, Acrimante's freedom. Also, in this case, there is a self-borrowing in the text, take from Largia by Cesti Apolloni. So this is uh, the opera Argia. Argia was very famous. He, it was uh, performed in Innsbruck for the Queen Christian of Sweden. Uh, and the, the libretto is uh, by Apolloni. And you can see very clearly uh, the, the borrowings, the self-borrowings. Uh, of the text uh, f um, between uh, Argia and Lempio Punito. <clears throat> the significance of this, uh, sorry, the, si the significance of this duet is that only here do the main, the two main characters finally have the same musical importance. To heighten the significance of this moment. Melani employs the incessant beat of eight notes, both in the basso continuo and violins, and the systematic use of suspensions and the repetition of portions of the text. It's a style that later composers like, like Alessandro Scarlatti and Handel, but 40 years later, adopt for particularly intense moments. The last aria that we will listen Pene, Pianti e Sospiri is Acrimante's last aria. He is in the, in the underworld, expressing his desire to die. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> the aria is in F mi uh, minor. It's a sort of lamento. It's each verse uh, of the first strophe starts on the second beat of the measure. The opening ritornello is similar to the ending one, and it, it's not usual in the opera and in, the, in this period. And there is also an isometric writing for the strings and repetition of some verbs as rhetorical strategy and melismas on the word lamenti. How all this could be associated with the, the stereotype of a Don Giovanni? In conclusion, I think that the dramaturgical core of the story, the outrage to the dead and the dinner invitation, represented the starting point, point, a reservoir from which to draw, similarly to what happened to the Commedia dell'arte circles, under which various other operatic, cultural and literary traditions were lived to build a complex, attractive, and spectacular theater theatrical event. However, there is an additional artistic layer to Lempio Punito. It is perhaps uh, paradoxical if we regard Acrimante Don Giovanni as a libertine that the most sublime moment of the opera is the duet Se d'amor la cruda sfinge, placed at the midpoint of the opera in which Acrimante and Atamira intone a text on the topos of the chains of love. The result is that libertinism, contempt for death, and the rules of honor are, as they were, dried up to give more space to the spectacular ostentation, the power of the figurative impact, and the charm of music. The myth of Don Giovanni is therefore the key that opens the door to visual and auditory spectacle, spectacle far from its previous meaning. Thank you very much.
That was delightful. Thank you so much. Giuseppe, would you like to start? Oh, thank you. It's up to you. If you want to start, shall I start? That's okay. <laughs> We've already had this debate for about exactly, five minutes. Exactly, about five minutes. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, after the quick change of sets uh, here in scene, like you know, in a Roman theater, let me say first of all, uh, uh, thank you so much for this, you know, wonderful edition. And uh, I think uh, congratulations are in order because uh, this is really a remarkable achievement. Uh, and uh, I enjoyed every single moment of the introduction <laughs> and the opera as well. <laughs> and uh, so thank you again. Uh, and uh, let me maybe begin by going back to, of course, a place at the time that I thought it really comes out from the introduction such, you know, in, with such an insightful take uh, on uh, what was indeed maybe a special couple of years. So this is Rome, and this is the fabulous uh, carnival seasons uh, of uh, 1668 and 1669. And uh, for those of you who are interested uh, about the 17th century opera, these are actually key years. Uh, it was a wonderful time for theater and opera. It only lasted two years in a way, even though there was more before and there would be more after. But why was that such a special, in a way, couple of years? And again, carnival seasons. Well, it is because there was a pope, indeed, the Clement IX, uh, whose reign only lasted a little over than two years. Yeah. But uh, of course, uh, Clement IX, uh, as uh, you know, uh, the introduction, your introduction explains it so well, was of course uh, Giulio Rospigliosi, who before he became Pope, was actually prominent, uh, prominent uh, author of opera librettos, and uh, so he was instrumental to the development uh, of uh, what we see today as Roman opera or the Roman brand of a 17th century opera next to, of course, its Venetian uh, counterpart. Um, so, of course, uh, when uh, uh, Giulio Rospigliosi became a pope in, uh, uh, um, for, for 42 years, everybody knew that this pope was going to support the theater and music. And of course, a lot of musicians, including uh, the Melani brothers, you know, went to Rome. This was the place to be. And of course, uh, the two carnival seasons of uh, 68 and 69, uh, again, uh, went down to history as uh, two particularly uh, important, uh, extravagant, uh, marvelous you know, moments uh, for uh, theater and opera. And of course, the uh, Empio Limpio Punito, was one of the new operas that were produced at that time. Now, of course, that didn't last very long for a variety of reasons. So, well, Clement IX died, um, again, after, as I said before, a little over two years uh, uh, when he became pope. And then, of course, we have uh, the holy year of 1675, uh, before that, in 1671, a public theater was opened in Rome, a little bit sort of a Venetian style. So as opposed to performances of operas in the private palaces uh, of uh, what we may call the Roman aristocracy or cardinals, uh, now we have a public theater, 1671. But 1675, we have uh, the Holy Year. So theaters were closed for that year. And uh, Teatro Tordinona was never reopened. Mm -hmm. So it ended there in a way. And uh, w one of the great things, actually, thinking about uh, this context, the historical context, this uh, you know, special moment uh, in the history of 17th century opera, and uh, the Empio Punito, as I was reading the introduction, and uh, I was you know, thinking about the opera, the plot line, uh, and I have to say, such a great example, <laughs> of course, uh, on some level, of what that kind of spectacle uh, meant uh, and was all about at that time. And of course, it's also a great example of what uh, later on uh, people thought, uh, this is all wrong. <laughs> we have to change this. Uh, 
And of course, uh, and again, I, I would love to hear your, your view on this. Uh, Empio Punito also, in a way, appears in a moment in which the tradition of this type of uh, 17th century opera is about to end. A few years later, we have uh, probably the first attempt to reform opera, a self-conscious attempt to change the direction of opera. And indeed, that will become uh, the Academy of the Arcadia and then uh, the type of opera we are more familiar with because of the work of Metastasio and then, of course, Handel. So in a way, if, you're, if you find L'Empio Punito a little odd, a little strange, <laughs> a little bit of an unusual type of spectacle, well, that's exactly what it is on some level because, of course, we are the product of an operatic reform that changed, to some extent, what was actually culturally important about this type of opera. And indeed, when you actually gave us this you know, sort of synopsis of the plot, did you see, for example, the sheer complexity of the plot? the subplots, and some of them are necessary, maybe some of them are not. So you end up with this kind of opera again, if you have a chance to listen to the Empio Punito, it's actually quite a work, it's a wonderful work in my view. And, um, and what do you have? That's exactly what you have, a convoluted plot, subplots, uh, fast-paced you know, cuts between uh, comic scenes and serious scenes, uh, this uh, mixture of the comic and the tragic. Uh, it's extravagant. Uh, it's undignified. It's a carnivalesque. Uh, it has it all. <laughs> it's exactly what you would expect uh, in this kind of opera until the desire for a more restrained, Aristotelian, uh, more tame, you can say, say type of opera became, uh, in a way, the object uh, of this uh, operatic reform. So uh, one of the striking elements uh, to me in this work uh, is on one side is a historical moment. And it's a moment that is about to become to an end, in a way. And yet, uh, and I don't know how you feel about this, uh, to me it's amazing how well the story of Don Giovanni Cremante fits uh, that kind of opera, that kind of extravagance, uh, exceedingly long, convoluted, somewhat chaotic, uh, comic, tragic. Somehow, the story of Don Giovanni fits uh, very well <laughs> that type of opera, that typology of opera that, again, as I said, it was about to, on some level, was about to come to an end, and indeed, I was actually thinking, of course, uh, then uh, later on uh, Mozart, uh, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden it dawned on me that uh, some of the ambiguous uh, qualities uh, of Mozart and Don Giovanni, including the tragicomic element, the idea that it's very hard to assign, uh, to some extent, a genre to that opera. It's in between tragic and comic. Uh, it, makes, uh, it makes us uncomfortable on some level exactly because of that ambiguity. Well, on some level, even Mozart's Don Giovanni in its ambiguity seems to carry the memory, to bear the memory of this moment in the history of opera in which, on the other hand, uh, all of that was still possible and was actually celebrated <laughs> as uh, one of the great achievements uh, of uh, you know, 17th century opera. And, uh, and I think uh, the Empio Punito is a wonderful example of this historical moment, the ambiguity of what it means uh, to set to music uh, as an opera the story of Don Giovanni Acrimante within the context of that type of opera. And then, of course, uh, thinking about uh, Mozart later on. There are also, but I'm going to stop here. Maybe we can simply you know, exchange ideas so I don't talk all the time I hear. There are also quite a few moments in the opera that I found very intriguing. Mm -hmm. And some of them were really surprising to me, including, but I'm going to stop here, that uh, we actually 
see the underworld, I should really say hell, twice. But the first time it's a fiction, the first time it's an illusion, and then at the end we see the, the real one. And uh, I was very much intrigued by the fictional representation of the, the hell in a way, and uh, when uh, Acrimante is asleep and there is this kind of dream sequence in which there's a sort of a double seduction going on. Uh, the demons, uh, Proserpina, trying to seduce Acrimante to believe that in the end, uh, eternal bliss uh, will be in hell. And Acrimante trying to seduce Proserpina. So I'm going to stop here. <laughs> It's very interesting what you say about this sort of the transitional nature of this moment. And I feel that we can hear that in the use of instrumentation. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about the, the inclusion of the viola da gamba in the opera, uh, uh, maybe as evidence for a sort of collecting, if you will, of a sonic picture of the past. And there, there is precedence for the Roman interpretation of older classical culture from the first melting of Greek bronzes after making marble copies. The Romans, in a way, are the first historical performers, the first historiographers. So you'll, you'll hear momentarily the sounds of drones in the triple meter section of Piangete when Atamira is falling asleep in the forest. And in our rehearsal, somebody mentioned the, the sound of the hurdy-gurdy. But I think what we're actually hearing in, in this moment is an evocation of the lira de braccio, the flat-bridged bowed string instrument that was used for chordal accompaniment to singing, and which had already been in the Italian peninsula for centuries um, before even the, uh, the viol's arrival um, at the end of the 15th century, and whose sound, in a sense, is meant to evoke, both within itself um, and also possibly in this moment, the, the lyre of, of Orpheus. So if we agree on the fact that the piece does call for the viola da gamba, and I think that we, we do, um, we're also, I think, in this work, hearing a looking back, uh, maybe with nostalgia, uh, to an exceptionally fruitful time of musical and sonic discovery in the Italian city-states at the time of the viol's arrival there. The instrument, the viola da gamba, comes from uh, Spain at the end of the 15th century on the heels of the election of the Catalan Pope Alexander VI, whose ascension in 1492 brought a surge of Catalan culture and Spanish musicians also into the Papal States, many of whom were, were Jews who brought their instruments with them. The vihuela de mano, the small guitar family instrument, and the vihuela de arco, essentially a bowed guitar, both begin to appear in the city-states at this time. And we also see makers in Brescia and Venice start to experiment in the first quarter of the 16th century with arching the bridge of the vihuela de arco, which gives the instrument the possibility of obbligato, playing, and ultimately a polyphonic repertory begins to accumulate. So this is when it starts to resemble the instrument that you'll see tonight. I'll hold up Matt's instrument here, um, an instrument that has six, sometimes seven strings in France, an arched bridge, sloped shoulders here, a flat back. These instruments that you'll see tonight are, are made to, they're both uh, uh, mine is a 20th, I think this is a 21st century copy of, of, of 17th century models. Um, but these are all crucial fixture, uh, features which distinguish them from that flat-bridged Leo de Braccio. So by the 1660s, when Milani is writing, the viol is starting to share the stage with the cello. And the cello, particularly in, in the Italian um, peninsula, is becoming more prominent as a continuo instrument. And you'll hear Matt Zucker play a beautiful cello continuo uh, momentarily. But the cello at this time is undergoing something of a profound evolution. And this is in part because of the invention at exactly this time in the 1660s of the wound C string, which is the lowest string of the cello. 
a string that has a gut core, but is wound with silver. So it's much thinner, uh, it's much more flexible, it's much more nimble than a pure gut C string, which is very thick and unwieldy. It's like playing with a, a tree trunk on your fingerboard. So this wound C starts to make things much more possible, um, and the cello has much more to do. But to say, however, that the viol is falling out of favor is, not, uh, is also not exactly accurate. We know that the viol is still in opera orchestras at the end of the 17th century. We see it in the late Monteverdi opera orchestras. We see it also in chamber music written throughout the Italian peninsula at the time. Uh, for example, uh, Dario Castello, uh, also in Rosenmuller's Italian works. But it's the, it's the obligato nature of its use in the Milani that is very significant and also somewhat unusual. As Luca uh, explained, uh, or explains in his, in his wonderful edition, there are three arias in the work that do suggest the use of two violas da gamba in place of two violins, all of which are for agrimante. And Luca mentions that they're scored in the, in the C clef, and uh, a, a bill that you uncovered dating to just three weeks after the opera's pre uh, premiere, uh, uh, records payments for the maintenance of Cardinal Chigi's consort of vials. Uh, so we've decided to play um, Pene Piante using, using tenor vials, which of course comes from Act 3, Scene 17. Curo d'Amor, another one of these C clef uh, arias, Act 2, Scene, uh, scene 4, is a, a bit high for the tenor vial, but it's not impossible. It stretches up to the E, so one note above the top fret of the top string on the tenor. So it's possible, but it would be awkward. Uh, so it may have been meant for the treble viol, the tenor viol, um, but they also could both be played on the alto viol. And we don't see the alto viol much these days, mainly because they were, they were cut down, actually, to make violas and violins. Um, it's also worth noting that the string changes all lie nicely as though on the alto viol. <clears throat> the second of these C clef moments, Act 3, Scene 16, right before the uh, scene that we'll play, uh, Act 3, Scene 17, uh, a, a mournful aria um, that you'll hear momentarily that we present last on the program, but this, this scene right before it, it has rhythmic values that are very similar to our scene 17, uh, whole note, half note patterns, uh, uh, similar timbre. Um, and it's, it's, it's interesting that these are back-to-back -back moments. So the musicians probably wouldn't have had to, to switch instruments. And they presumably would have been doubling, but maybe Luca um, can elaborate on, on that. You suggest also in your edition that the orchestra would have been very small, despite, of course, the 21st century performance practices of filling out the continuo section, which is not, by the way, what we will be doing tonight. Um, uh, you cite a mere nine musicians present in Cheste's Orontia, which premiered um, in the same hall eight years before. So the alto viol would comfortably cover all three of these C clef arias, and it certainly would have saved them some, some cash. It would have kept the orchestra a bit smaller, two players instead of four. And finally, we can't think of mourning and the viola da gamba without thinking, of course, of Bach's John Passion. Of course, many years later, Leipzig, 1724, um, some 60 years after this piece. The sonority of the viol, the, its closeness to the voice is what brings Bach back to this instrument, the viol aria, as he's vollbracht, an incredible moment where, where the motive uh, portrays the crying Mary Magdalene, her tears falling, using, the gr using gravity to articulate this phrase. In the morning moment that we'll play on viols, um, Pene Piante, the, the viol lines move, move upward into the pain, maybe this desire to leave the underworld, uh, we're very high in our register. Our motives are dominated by motion up by a fifth, up by a fourth, sometimes up by a minor second and various points of dissonance in a gesture that uh, seems to resemble the ancient Greek gesture of mourning, where we see, which we see all over the iconography, women with their hands up 
over their eyes, wailing, mourning upward, so very different from Bach's Lutheran gravitas, here a kind of pagan performance of mourning. Shall we take some questions from the audience, or maybe if you would like to add some comments to our brief remarks? <laughs> no, no, for me, our, um, thank you, Bose, uh, uh, are very important, this kind of uh, suggestions, because uh, I think that Giuseppe uh, pointed out very clearly the, 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 con the, 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 the context of, the, of uh, the, 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 the history of Ro of opera in that moment, and it's and it's very. Uh, I, I agree totally because in that in that e in those years, um, in Rome was was not um, opera in Rome was not um, a business like in Venice. Uh, opera was something absolutely special and not to 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 be performed a second or or a third time. Uh, Lempio, we, we know that Lempio Punito was performed maybe three times and then, st and then stopped because it was not conceived to, to be re reproduced uh, as, for instance, Il Giazone or Venetian opera. So I think this is uh, really um, important to, to, to underline the, the very special moments and th those three years uh, when, when Rospigliosi was, was the Pope. And then after after a few years, also in Rome with, with the Teatro de Tordinona in 1671, um, the situation changed totally. So in, in this um, context, Lempio Punito is a, a, a perfect mirror of, of, of the period. And also in the music, of course, of course I, have no, I had no time to explain all the scores, the, 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 the Melanie's choices about music, but it's really a very experimental music. Um, and in a few seconds, you, you are in, in, in the Commedia dell'arte, and then, you, and then you, are, you are to the heaven, and then there are um, double sense, erotic uh, meanings uh, in changing every, every minute. So it's really... Um, a field of ec uh, extreme experimentation that stopped uh, after a few years. So I, I, I totally agree with, with Giuseppe. It's very modern in a way. Yes. It's, very, it's an oddly quasi-post-modernism <laughs> collage quality to it. Absolutely. Uh, which makes it, uh, such a, uh, to me, again, such a vivid also portrait of the world of Don Giovanni Acrimante, mm -hmm. the world in which these characters seem to live. Mm. And then, of course, we have no time, but th there is another enormous uh, problem, no problem or um, uh, issue, that the, 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 the voice, the register of the voice, because uh, Don Giovanni here is a soprano castrato. <laughs> So if we think to Don, of Don Giovanni, of course, we, we, we have another idea of his voice. <laughs> and he was a castrato and of the Cappella Pontificia. So it's another, another world, you know, it's totally different. Uh, it's very interesting. And um, about the instruments, and oh, I'm very happy because um, to, to share these um, ideas, because we don't have any source, uh, archival source. The, the only one I found in the Archivio Vaticano, in, the, in this Fondo Chigi, about the maintenance of, of this Concerto delle Viole. So the, this was the starting point of my reflection and the hypothesis to, to, to use uh, these instruments and not the violins. But otherwise, we, d we don't have any information. So I think it's, it's uh, something that we have to to try and, and to think and to, to propose and discuss with the musicians also uh, in this sense. So I'm, I'm very, very happy because, because there are no other ways to, to solve the problems and, and to, to try to, to fix or, or uh, to find solutions uh, in this, in this uh, repertoire. And w I know that in, in past productions of Lempio Punito, some conductors used uh, flutes or other instruments, but it's, it's, it's very problematic because we, I think we, we, we have to be very, very 
to to think uh, very deeply about about uh, the choices in this kind of issues. We're in a, another kind of moment of transition, 18th century figuration with 17th century harmony, and that uh, really was problematic in, in, I think, the first run of this piece yesterday in the rehearsal. I, I remember very well, in, in, in after the end of the, res the rehearsal, the, the situation changed totally. Right. Once, we f once we figured out what was going on. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we take a questions from the audience, or do we have maybe a few minutes? Okay, uh, wonderful. I don't know if there are any questions. Uh, Maybe we should listen to the music. Shall we go straight to the music? Okay, so let's the music talk. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Maybe I'll just take a moment to acknowledge the musicians by name. Uh, Jude Ziliak and Jeremy Reiser will be playing violin. Matt Zucker will be playing Bode Continuo on, on the cello. Um, Dushan Barlerin will be playing Theorbo Continuo. Um, Nola Richardson um, will sing our soprano, and Heather Petrie will sing our contralto, and I will pop in at the end and join Matt on the viola da gamba.
questo cuore. 